we're at a point of significant disruption in society. Um, this is partly as a result of the crises that we, you know, every time you turn on the television or pick up a newspaper, you become aware of the crises that are converging in our civilization. It's also as a result of the information technology revolution that we're living through. So, for example, in the field of, and this is something we've been studying in our course, in the field of transport, conventional public transport taxis are being disrupted by the introduction of apps like um, Uber, blah, blah, car, car sharing, carpooling. Um, in finance, the banks are, you know, suddenly there's all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer really interesting innovation happening in finance with threatening the banks. And the same thing is happening really across society. Um, it's certainly happening in the field of education. So these are two luminaries. One is no sector operates more inefficiently than education. A new breed of disruptors is going to fix it. Um, and this other senior professor saying the current educational system will not exist in 10 years. So where are the sources of disruption? Um, one is uh, just dissatisfaction with, with 20th century industrial reductionist education that is not fit for purpose. I mean, we, it's difficult for us to even imagine how the economy is going to be in, uh, the economy society is going to be in 10, 15 years time. So to continue to educate people within an industrial system that was churning out industrial workers in the 20th century is clearly not, um, it's not fit for purpose. So I really, I really like this, uh, this quote. It's summary of two studies that covered a lot of business and organizational leaders and students in 60 countries. The conclusion, the critical need now is for not for industrial workers, but for creative leaders able to think outside the very system that produced them. Topping the list of what global CEOs and students are looking for as they face the future are creative thinking, the capacity to collaborate, the capacity to communicate effectively, the capacity to be open, flexible, empathetic, to express global perspectives, simple technical and mathematical knowledge, that's which our schools are currently designed to teach and with which our accrediting agencies are concerned, ranked low on the list. So an important source of disruption is dissatisfaction both from students and from potential employers. Throw into the mix the levels of debt that students are having to emerge from the system with, and also the emergence of MOOCs, the massive open online courses, and it's clear that the education system really does need to respond. So, as I said before, looking at the, the two ideograms that make up crisis, it's a moment of opportunity. So, I tried to, like, it, with the experience in Findhorn and here in the college, I tried to just dissect, like, what are the, what are the key things that we're doing that make the education here distinctive? And I came up with six. Um, now, I'm pretty sure if you were to ask any member of the college community to come up with a list, they'd come up with a different list. I mean, I think there'd be crossover. So this is a highly subjective um, interpretation of what it is that we're doing that leads people at the end of even four days in a short course to be sitting there gasping for breath and struggling to find words to describe the power of the transformation. Um, I think the first is that... Um, that all of the education is clearly rooted in ecological thinking. So uh, I lead an economics course, and I'm pretty sure it's the world's only economics master's program that begins with holistic science. It's kind of, it's consciously locating economics as a subsystem of ecology. So um, kind of the, the playful proposition is if you want to if you want to understand how to create an effective money system or an effective enterprise, go and take a walk in the forest and, and really study very closely the symbiotic relationships between the elements within a forest system. And that'll be as good a place as any to start in trying to understand how we create systems fit for the 21st century. So this is um, really all our programs, short courses, all of the master's programs would have as their core motif, nature as mentor. Uh, and that's reflected in the learning spaces, in the activities, 
This is our outdoor classroom. Um, and there's a lovely quote here from the US educator, uh, David Orr. All education is environmental education. By what is included or excluded, students are taught that they are part of or apart from the natural world. To teach economics, for example, without reference to the laws of thermodynamics or ecology, is to teach a fundamentally important ecological lesson, that physics and ecology have nothing to do with the economy. It just happens to be dead wrong. So it seems to me that, that something that's not unique to here, but it's, it's distinctive, certainly in the accredited programs, is the assumption that that certainly in the field, that they're really all systems are subsystems of ecology, that they're all human systems are located within living ecological systems. However, this is not unique, as I said, by any means to human macroecology, and increasingly just regular schools uh, are looking to outdoor activities. This is a forest school activity, um, park school up the road, uh, Dartington Primary School. Um, I noticed that they the big words that they want, this is their main web page, creativity, challenge, reflection, empathy and compassion are up front. Um, and uh, a lot of space given there at the bottom, that's a quote taken from their forest school activity. Forest school activities are carefully set up to ensure success while encapsulating our core learning value, value which is challenge. When children are challenged at an appropriate level and then succeed, they fulfill their potential and there is a positive impact on their self-esteem. So this is just the first little suggestion that actually what we're doing, which I think maybe 25 years ago when the college was created, might have been never probably unique, but pretty distinctive, actually may no longer be quite so distinctive. Uh, many primary and secondary schools are looking to forest school activities as part of their core activities, their core curriculum. Um, and uh, it doesn't even need to be, uh, I mean, I think all the places I've mentioned so far have, to have an easy access because they're rurally based to uh, beautiful open spaces. But this is a, a little, one of the best schools I've ever been to. It's a school in Porto Alegre in Brazil, uh, right in the heart of an industrial city where they've created this beautiful little uh, green oasis that the, the primary school is located within. It's a beautiful uh, uh, it, it's one of the most impressive schools I've been to and um, in my work in Brazil I found quite a lot of little um, urban educational oases. So the first, uh, as I say, I identified six things that I think are distinctive about a, a transformative education. Uh, one is rooted in ecology, second is um, a real embracing of whole person education. So certainly the school that I went to, and I'm guessing the school, I mean, is this, uh, I'm kind of looking for feedback now from body language feedback from people working in education, that uh, certainly the tradition that I grew up in was one which tried to stimulate the left side of the brain alone. And the idea, so certainly your emotional self was told to park at the door. Uh, your physical self as well as your were sat in a seat in a row in front of or behind others. Is that still broadly the experience? Good, well, it's really good that there's some hesitation there. Um, because certainly here, the circle would be, like for me to be in this position, speaking to, to, to a serried ranks is a bit of an unusual and slightly intimidating experience because here the, uh, the architecture of choice certainly would be the circle. Um, so, as part of this uh, embracing a whole person education, I mean, definitely the lecture, did de formal didactic uh, transmission of information is an important part. This is Fritjof Capra, one of the regular presenters at the college, doing what Fritjof does really well. Anybody done a course of Fritjof Capra? He does this really well. He, he talks at his audience. So there is a place for this. Um, but my experience as an educator is that when the learning stops there, it tends to be superficial, not to last particularly long. Um, so uh, there's a very strong, uh, this is the great Matthew Fox who is leading, um, who is refusing just to speak to his audience, but it, encouraging them to engage physically. Um, I, I, I noticed that um, 
that I would work, uh, uh, when I started my career as an educator, I was within the conventional system and so simply transmitting knowledge um, and dealing with pretty dark, I mean, if you teach economics, you're dealing with pretty dark material in terms of describing the impact of human beings on the planet. Um, but I would notice two things that I would notice that in those early years when the education was limited to the, transform to the transmission of facts was one, that the students would move almost immediately into problem solving mode. So it seemed to me that really with what was being described, a healthy human reaction would be some sort of catharsis or emotional shock at simply the severity of the problems we're facing. But almost never did I experience a, an emotional, what to me in retrospect would have felt like a, a healthy emotional response to the nature of the information. It was almost immediately going into problem solving mode. And the second thing I noticed among the students and among myself as well, uh, with myself as well, was that within an hour or two, it was almost as if the lecture hadn't happened. Uh, that really the next thing had come up, the football team was playing or the girlfriend, the boyfriend, whatever it was, whatever little drama in the foreground of, of, of our little lives would take over and this stuff, in other words, it simply wasn't landing. Um, and I had the good fortune to work with a meditation teacher in India and one of, the, one of the things that she used to say that really impressed me was that in her tradition, they don't use the word to understand for purely cognitive, for, for having facts. They, use the, they reserve the, the use of the word to understand for when the being is transformed by the new knowledge, that their behavior will not, they will not see the world again, the same again as a result of the, the experience they've had. And I noticed that this very rarely, if ever, happens as a result of the transmission of information. And so one of my own strong interests has been bringing theatre, movement, physicality into the classroom to enable the students. I mean, it is important to be able to reflect upon and think about systems from the outside as an, as an analyst. But I think it's even more important to be able to speak from within the system as a participant. And uh, my experience has been that actually it has been the engagement of the cells of that cellular level the students get it when that you actually find a way of bringing the emotions and physicality into the classroom uh, so that they're not just leaving with head knowledge but actually with a, a deeply embodied experience of what the system actually feels like. So an important, important, an important part of the way that we work is through art. It's got a, it really holds a critical role in, in, in not bypassing the left side of the brain, but in deepening, in deepening and in helping the students to embody the new learning. So a lot of um, creativity, uh, as exemplified, this is one of our students, a little short film clip, one of our students uh, who was on the <coughs> horticulture programme last year. I'm starting a, a bakery and growing some grain, growing some ancient grain. Um, in school farm down the road, an acre of grain. So that's starting from ancient grain through milling, uh, making of bread and pasta. Um, so that will hopefully be a revenue stream or maybe a business for us, for me. And the way that I'm putting together my uh, assignments um, is with a combination of writing and drawing and painting. So I'm writing and drawing a phosphorus essay at the moment. So it's cartoon format with some narrative behind it. You're allowed to express yourself in many ways, uh, which is which is which I, I've, in my educational experience, is unique. But we are not unique in this. In this I think um, that most schools now, uh, certainly the schools that I am able to go to, um, have lots of murals and paintings and real celebration of creativity among the kids. So this again, that I think maybe. I could be wrong, but my feeling is 25 years ago when the college started, schools were much more industrial looking in a way that the schools that I'm visiting today are not. They're, they, this is much more uh, kind of entered the culture of education. So a third uh, ecological thinking, whole person learning, a third 
element as I try to dissect what it is that, that is distinctive about the Findhorn Schumacher experience is collaboration. So students are consciously encouraged to work together. Um, again, in my experience of conventional, more conventional education, collaboration is called cheating. Um, but again, going back to this, uh, going back to the quote from the IBM surveys at the minute, that it is clear that in the world we're moving into, the teamwork and collaboration is a critical skill. Um, so students are, are I mean, we, we positively encourage students to do assessed assignments in teams. Um, we introduced an experiment last year that we're repeating this year, where at least one of the activities will be uh, self-assessed, peer assessed and faculty assessed so that the marks will be split between a third given by the student on their own work, a third by peers of the students in small design groups and a third by faculty members. Uh, I'm going to ask you to guess which of these three you think delivers the lowest mark. <laughs> the students. So the self-assessment is always my, I've done this for a number of years and the students always you know, the fear is the students are going to give themselves 100% and, and the reverse is the experience. Um, so I remember last year having a battle with some students saying, your work was much better than that. <laughs> um, so the importance of teamwork and collaboration, I think, is a, is a really critical part of the puzzle. Just some pictures of college life. But again, my experience of, um, I'm getting the opportunity, as I've embarked on this, um, on this inquiry, I'm visiting a number of different schools to see how they're doing it and to, to kind of take in this question, you know, how wide is the divide between places like this and more conventional institutions and how can we bridge the gap between them? And I'm finding, like my hypothesis has been, the gap is not as wide as we sometimes imagine. I mean, I think there are definitely constraints in terms of the, the sheer scale of the national curriculum, and the pressure that, that staff are under and the, the increase in bureaucracy as we have here as well. But nonetheless, I, my hypothesis that the gap between us is less severe than it used to be uh, has been borne out by my school visits. This is a, a school in Bristol. I met the head teacher in the pub one night uh, and we became buddies in Bristol. Uh, and I'm gonna be going up and, and speaking at this school next month. Um, and they're doing tremendous team-based, a lot of their work is, is based around design teams. Um, this is one of their projects working in, uh, in Uganda and they try where possible to, to enfold the conventional learning within the context of particular projects like this in a way that really brings it alive for the students. Um, a further, a fourth um, distinctive thing I think about here, which is perhaps more difficult to replicate, is scale. I think what you call scale. It's one of those Irish words, scale. So the scale here is definitely, we have um, 15 students maximum uh, to our master's programs. So the short courses tend not to have more than about 25. And this is a scale at which it, it's definitely an important part of the experience, that the, the ratio of staff to students is way better than in most schools. However, it's not unique, and there are ways that we can that we can take this model and that we, in fact, we are taking this model out into more conventional settings. So this is a really interesting, this is from our main meeting hall, just to show the, the scale and intimacy that, that is allowed in, in, in this type of institution. Um, this experiment in taking the Schumacher College way of working, just the rhythms of the day and the rhythms of the week out of the college into a, into, this is Northern Ireland, so it's, it's the law faculty, um, uh, and there are a couple of people in, in the law faculty who are very forward-thinking radical people who've been to the college, love the college, and I've been over working with them, taking a residential week of law master's students uh, to a place in the country. And, and like, I'm really curious, what's gonna happen with, with, if we take this model into, like, law students are not renowned as being the most radical in the university. Um, Belfast certainly is not the most radicalized city in the UK. Um, so um, how would it be to take the Schumacher College model, the way of working without any censorship, 
into a residential context with small groups of students, many of whom have never heard of Schumacher College before and have no idea, they certainly haven't signed up for it. They're turning up because uh, it's part of the course. It's a residential element as part of the course in a small group. Um, the first um, couple of days, any of you who are teachers, if you worked, I think we've all worked with groups who they spend the first two days going, body language, no feedback at all, and it really tests your ability to stand in, in your power as an educator. That was very much the case here. And, okay, this will tell the tale. They've established their own... Well, there's a great deal of uh, talk of leadership. We've had very interesting contributions about, as it were, leading from below, uh, in a way at, like a support that a leader is actually a facilitator of others. I think in this new economy, if you like, it's almost everyone, everyone is being called on to be more creative, to develop their skills, to themselves contribute, not only to themselves, but to common projects. One of the best bits I thought was at the start of each session, uh, there was a bell that was chimed and then kind of a moment's silence and kind of an open floor for anybody to say anything that they felt or anything that they'd been thinking about. And by the last day, there was so much to be said and so many wonderful things that were being developed that they kind of became sessions in themselves. It was the opportunity to bring Schumacher into the programme for the students at Queen's represented a unique opportunity for them to come out of the conventional teaching context where the opportunities are sometimes limited to go deep, to spend time not only on the subject but to go deep in collaboration with one another. It wasn't just looking at writing and, and debating philosophical points, it was personal inquiry and how does this make you feel? I did feel that it um, helped me clarify some of the areas that I need to look into in more detail, some of the gaps in my knowledge. Everyone's having their own inquiry, everyone's wanting to get different things out of this and you're there, everyone's learning instead of people just teaching, like the people that are teaching were learning at the same time and I thought that was very important and it's something that isn't in any study I've done. Um, a fifth thing that, I, that, that, that seems to me distinctive is uh, a real unashamed embracing of beauty. The place is just covered in gorgeous paintings, artwork often generated by the students and also by really high quality food. I think I'm putting these in the same category. It's like, um, like in, even through all the financial travails that the college has been through. It was very similar in Fintorn. Even through the financial travails that they've been through, the kitchen budget was the one thing that was ring-fenced never to be touched. Like you cannot learn uh, without, this is certainly Satish, the founder of the college, is you cannot, <laughs> you can't be educated without damn good food. Um, so a real unashamed celebration of magnificent food, great festivals, uh, and, and just physical beauty all around the place. But again, you know, I'm not sure, I mean this would have been deeply distinctive some time ago, but the, uh, there is now, um, a few months ago when Michael Gove was still the education minister, uh, a new policy went through on food that Jimmy Oliver and several others who've been very critical said, actually it took him a long time but he's really got it, and really approving of the policy on school food. Growing number of schools, uh, embracing gardens and having their students out in the gardens producing the food that will be served in the kitchen as part of the curriculum. So again, the gap is narrowing. Um, this is, um, uh, I, I co-teach the programme with Tim Crabtree, this is his daughter in the middle. He's been involved in lots of school food initiatives in Dorset and West Dorset. And the final one, which I think could just hold the key to uh, important insights and breakthroughs and that is the fact that the college community is a self-managing body. 
So it, it kind of feels like living in a workers' co-op. Um, so with staff and students together, cooking, cleaning, um, you know, looking after the place. Um, and it seems to me that this is, um, uh, I, I want to come back to this right at the end. There's just a little section and then I want to, want to draw some conclusions based on this uh, idea, the, the, the core importance of moving from top-down authoritarian hierarchical organizations into self-managing communities and the potential that this holds for actually shifting the center of gravity, not just of educational practice, but of society as a whole. So I'm going to come back to that right at the end. Um, in the meantime, I just I wanted to, um, to go back to, particularly in the field of economics, to explore why this moment is particularly ripe for disruption. So any of you who've been following the world of economics teaching will have got that there is something of a rebellion among the, stu the student community. So bodies like Rethinking Economics, students in Paris, in Manchester, in a number of different cities going enough. The way that we're being taught, taught economics, uh, uh, it needs to change, both in terms of the content and how it's being taught. Um, this is a, a short clip from a film that was made. This was actually the dissertation submission uh, of one of our students two years ago. And this is just one little section of the film that she made. How are they working for change and why? One of the things that has really been striking about the past year or so is the fact that student groups in so many different countries are emerging to demand that what they are, what they are taught must, must change. We read um, in The Guardian that a new society was being formed by economic students that, that were tired of hearing about the same models um, that after the crash have been demonstrated quite accurately that they don't work anymore. Um, the world has changed and the syllabus hasn't changed. So I suppose it, it, it gives the whole idea behind what we are trying to do. Students all over the world have begun to organize by signing petitions, hosting talks and debates, organizing reading groups, and even offering alternative courses for students. My personal motivation is that I would really like economics departments to become the kind of place where um, new economic thinkers who care about social issues, who care about rigorous methodology, who care about intellectual creativity. I really want economics departments to be the places where they want to go to, rather than places that they feel limited by. Whilst I was at the LSE, I felt like I wanted to use the position of strength that we had from within the department as students to organise, to change those departments for the better. And through that, I felt like there was actually a huge number of people who wanted to organise for more pluralistic economics and more people than I'd ever encountered kind of personally. And that's where the idea of setting up a network that would bring those people together came about. So that's how Rethinking Economics came about. You tap into networks that have already started, on, or little initiatives that have already started on, I don't know, post-crash economics, um, a society for economic pluralism. So it's, it's like, it's like you, 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 you tap the beehive, you, you feel that there's so much buzz everywhere. The teaching of economics is outdated and is connected from the real world, in, not only in the UK, but in many places. We are in conversations with similar networks in, in Germany, uh, people in New York, Pepsi Economy in Paris, student groups in Denmark, in Canada, we're talking to people in Italy, in Beijing, in India, in Brazil. It's very, very exciting. So this is, this is going to be great. <laughs> um, and this is the one slide that actually is a plug. So this is a plug for an event that we're putting on here next April, uh, Generation of the New Economy, where many of the people you've seen in this, uh, this, this last video clip are going to be invited um, to the college for a week-long exploration of kind of setting a new agenda for the teaching of economics uh, fit for the 21st century. Um, and, um, um, you know, the, 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 the interest, the, the shifting of the centre of gravity of education is happening not just in this country, as we've seen. This is from China, where 
uh, the, the goal of the Chinese government is uh, the creation of an ecological civilization. Uh, and uh, one of the key universities behind uh, the, something called the Rural Reconstruction Movement, the Southwestern University in China, has contacted the college and we're going to be running uh, a degree together with them. Um, lots of other initiatives, uh, Iberia, Colombia, there's many other places where universities and non-formal organizations creating partnerships with the college. And I'm sure this is happening with transformative educational institutes the world over as, we're, as we see the shift in the center of gravity of educational thinking. So I just want to come back, just two slides left. Um, I want to come back to this uh, idea of the final one of the six points that I suggested that was one of the things that makes radical transformative experiential education distinctive and that may just hold the key to having a wider impact not just in the educational system but on society itself. And that is this element of um, to do with the self managed the, the, the community being a self-managing body. And of course, within the British educational experience, there's been a proud heritage here going all the way back to Summerhill, uh, our own uh, park school, uh, the, the Dartington School as well. This idea of the community being a democratic community in which students and staff have equal rights, where the students do their homework if they want, where they go to class if they want, where they have a big role to say in the management of the community and um, kind of bringing in a, um, a bit of a conceptual background in this. The 20th century, as I mentioned right at the beginning, has been dominated by battles between the left and the right over arguments about the primacy of the, the state or the, the primacy of the market. Um, however, what is becoming increasingly clear as we step back from this little moment of history into the wider context of the human experiencing experience uh, uh, as the anthropologists tell it is that there has always been this territory called the commons enclosed in the from the 14th 15th century in uh, on these islands but still around about um, uh, 40% of the global population, their livelihood still depends on access to the global commons. And we as a species have developed highly distinctive, refined rules and regulations for living together, setting the rules ourselves for how we manage our spaces. This making any sense? So the, the, the idea of commonly collectively owned resources and spaces and relationships that neither the state nor the market are regulating. And it seems to me, the, 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 for me this is where the penny dropped about the use of the word homecoming. Is that my feeling is that what people, when they come into places like this, are remembering with this, this use of the word homecoming is this deep societal memory of being responsible for co-creating the ethics, the values, and the behavior in a place rather than those being determined either by the state or the market. And so um, th th this is a photograph of a recent um, event that was held in Findhorn called the New Story Summit. This is something I'm especially interested in, is the idea that, that uh, how we experience the world and the possibilities that we see are determined by the stories that we live within. And kind of a general recognition by people who are paying attention that the stories that we're living in at the minute have ceased to make sense. So what is the new story? What are the new stories that we need to inhabit? And this was one, yet another event that I go to that spent quite a lot of the time with people trying to think their way through to what's the new story, like furrowed brows, what's the new story? Um, and uh, my feeling is that we get to the new story not by thinking about it, but by actually having the embodied experience of living it. And so increasingly it seems to me that the, the gift of places like here and Findhorn are places where people can have the embodied experience, not just thinking about what the new story is, what the good society might be, but actually having the lived embodied experience of co-creating it. Um, I really love this quote from uh, Karen Armstrong. Um, she writes very, it's a former nun, she writes very eloquently about God. She wrote a wonderful book called A History of God. Religion is not about accepting 20 impossible propositions before breakfast, but rather about doing things that change you. It is a moral aesthetic, an ethical alchemy. If you behave in a certain way, you will be transformed. 
So this insight, this beautiful insight that she has that actually being a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim was less about signing up to a different, to a set of belief systems as adopting a set of practices that would strengthen your muscles for compassion, empathy, um, generosity, love. Um, and so it seems to me that that is actually what we're doing, that this is our morning meeting, the morning meeting space where the community gets together and, and sets the tone for values, ethics and behaviour. Um, and so my feeling is that the gift, the real distinctive gift, is providing spaces in which people can inhabit in a way that we're going to need to do as the crises come rolling in upon us. You know, when, as that moment comes, do I want to be surrounded by people who have conceptually worked out what the new story is? Or do I want to be surrounded by people who have a lived experience of creating community within that? Of course, it's the latter. So this, just in conclusion, it seems to me, is the potential role for education seeded from places like this, but increasingly seeded out into the mainstream, is to, to see if we can if we can help to create pop-up spaces in which people can have the embodied experience of co-creating their own learning community. Uh, and my inquiry is how we do that. So I would welcome any perspectives. <laughs>